Well, welcome. This is the second video uh, in the uh, Digital Systems Design EE 3563 course. Well, uh, so I want to pick up where we left off on uh, Monday. Uh, we had just gotten into Chapter 2, so we'll jump back in. But before I do that, uh, I want to say a couple things. One, uh, so uh, we pass out a bunch of boards, and if you didn't get your board, try and come to the lab on uh, Wednesday. You can just stop by briefly, pick up the board, and leave. Um, and hopefully everybody will get their board. For those that don't, then uh, we'll try and work out some other arrangement. But it, it would really be uh, great if you could come by and pick it up. Uh, you don't have to do lab, but uh, if you could just pick up your board in person, that would make it a whole lot easier. Um, there was plenty of room in the lab, and some people stayed around and worked on the labs, and that's great. And if you wanted to go home and work on the lab, that's fine. I will conduct a help session uh, for this lab uh, maybe uh, maybe Friday afternoon or Thursday sometime. I will, I'll put that out. Um, I'll probably just send out an email with the Zoom link to the whole class, and you can and you can participate if you want. I don't know. It, it lagged there for a minute, but I guess it's okay. Uh, yep. So okay. So anyway, um, so that having been said, uh, that's good. Remember, you have two weeks for this first lab, and uh, if you have problems, uh, if you have problems, you should come to the to the lab tomorrow and get some help from either me or the TA. Um, okay. Uh, so let me just let me just put up the syllabus real quick, Lee. So here it is, and uh, I, I want to scroll way, all the way down to where we have the schedule, which is somewhere down in here. All right, so we're going to be on the 26th. Now what's listed is the prerequisite test. Uh, so uh, since we don't have to do this uh, in class, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, I mean, we're not going to do the video on the prereq test. Uh, I might uh, on Friday. I might work it on the video a little bit or something. But I will hopefully. Uh, I don't have it. I don't have it converted to online format yet. So I'll do that and hopefully get it posted uh, no later than Friday. I'm hoping. And so then you can just download it and do it uh, at your convenience. Try and get it done this week uh, and uh, and just and and complete it. It'll be just a regular online test. Um, doesn't count won't hurt you uh, but try and give it your best shot okay uh, so we'll get that done meanwhile today instead of the prereq test which we normally do in class uh, we're just going to go on with the lecture okay so I think that's all I wanted to say about that uh, so let me shrink this down and um, put this in display mode okay so here's where we ended. We were just going to talk about the contents. This is unit two. Remember, um, let's see, we skipped unit one uh, because I'm going to come back and pick that up in a, in, when I finish it with unit two. Unit one is a review of logic design. But I wanted to get into the Verilog so you can have some of the basics uh, for, so you can get started on the labs. And then we'll do the review and, and, uh, and then uh, my plan at least in the past it's always been to give you a test over the logic design review and that's probably what I'll do although I will see but anyway that's my plan at the moment um, and uh, that's all laid out in the syllabus and we'll, we'll probably stick pretty close to the syllabus alright so we're going to cover here in chapter 2 computer aided design, hardware description languages very large description of combinational circuits, very large modules, very large assignments procedural assignments, modeling flip-flops using always blocks and the weight statement Okay, so, and a few other things. So, that's what we're going to do. And then, these are some of the other things uh, in Unit 2 that we're eventually going to cover. All right. So, when we do computed ADA design, uh, it sort of looks like this. Uh, we start off with a, uh, with a requirements document that lays out what, what our product has to do. Um, this is very similar to what you do in senior design. Uh, and then we lay out our design specifications. So, uh, and this has to do with, uh, you know, how fast clocks have to be and how big the memory has to be or whatever. And, you know, just we, we, we really sort of spec out what it's going to take to meet these requirements. And then uh, we, start, we start composing the design. And 
uh, in the digital world, this means writing it in hardware description language. Uh, in the old days, they did a lot of schematic capture. That might apply rarely these days for a little block of the overall design, but probably not much. Mostly, we're going to put it in. Uh, we're going to put it out in uh, in in a hardware description language and typically Verilog. Uh, and then we're going to do a simulation, pre-synthesis, and make sure that our behavioral model behaves in the way we expect it to. And then once we finish with that, then we will uh, synthesize it and do the post-synthesis simulation. And then we're going to go through the process of, and this is where things start to divide a little bit. If we're going to program uh, an FPGA, then we kind of go one way. If we're going to actually make an integrated circuit, now we go another way. If we're going to do the metalized mask on an application-specific uh, integrated circuit, then we kind of go another way. And and you're pretty much going to use the appropriate software for the pathway you're going. In our case, we're using Vivado. Vivado is set up to generate bid files for Xilinx FPGAs, and that's what we're going to do. All right, so, uh, so then we go through uh, mapping, placement, and routing. This is device specific. So if you're making your own integrated circuit, you're going to have one set of mapping, placement, and routing. If you're going to program, do an, assay, an, an application specific integrated circuit where it's all built except for the metalized mass that goes on top and connects everything, then you're going to do that. If on the other hand you're going to program an FPGA, then, uh, then, then you're going to take the existing FPGA and you're going to map your design into it, uh, figure out uh, where it's going to be placed and how to route it around within the FPGA. Um, and all these steps are done pretty much in, uh, in the, using a computer. Uh, they're not really, uh, you know, it's, it's really a software program that's running. And you're not actually, um, you're not actually making hardware until you take what's produced and either load the bit file and now you have a program set of logic or take the uh, all the photo mask and all the foundry steps and go to the foundry and make a circuit. Okay. Um, so, let's see, I don't know why I did that. So, um, we have verification at all these levels uh, and uh, every level has to have has to have sign offs. Uh, this is where uh, supervising these projects uh, can get a little crazy, and uh, and you have to absolutely make sure that uh, that at every level uh, you have validated the design, verified that uh, it's uh, it's on track to do what you want the to what the requirements originally laid out. Um, all right, so. One of the things that um, one of the things that's uh, the, the sort of the two distinctions here, we we talk about uh, our behavioral design, and then we talk about structural design. So normally we'll start at the high level and we'll give a behavioral description. This is basically the algorithmic level, where we haven't necessarily picked uh, you know what kind of gates we're going to use or any particular physical component. But what we have done is we've, we've laid out what we want the device to do logically. And then uh, as, we are, as our design matures, then we're going, to, uh, we're going to add in exactly how we're going to do it. Uh, maybe we're going to start talking about specific gates, but more likely we'll start talking about uh, sort of specific blocks of logic. So for instance, say we're doing an adder. At the behavioral level, we can just write C equals A plus B. But when we start getting more detailed, now we're going to have to specify the bit width of A, the bit width of B, bit width of C, and we're also going to have to start talking about what kind of adder. Are we going to do a ripple carry adder? Are we going to do a carry look ahead adder? Are we going to do a carry propagate adder? There's a whole bunch of different adders we can do, and what are we going to do? And um, so this this becomes uh, this is where we begin to s specify our final uh, goal with a little more uh, detail. And um, depending on which kind of adder we're going to actually make to do this, it, it's going to definitely change how fast it calculates the result, and it also is going to change uh, the hardware that it's going to take to make it. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And some of these things are somewhat built into the synthesizers these days. So 
you may be able to just say C equals A plus B, and then you know that your synthesizer is going to apply uh, a, uh, a, a, a advanced uh, adder uh, model or, uh, in order to uh, uh, make the, the behavioral description run as fast as possible. So as the, as synthes as the synthesizers get smarter and smarter, uh, the number of decisions you actually have to make along the way gets somewhat less and less. Um, all right, synthesis is when we turn your software description into uh, something that can begin to, uh, to create our physically realized product. In the case of uh, what we're doing with FPGAs, this means we're going to generate a bit, uh, essentially a net list that's eventually going to turn into a bit file that's going to be programmed into our specific chip. So at this level, it's still fairly, it's still somewhat generic, the net list. But then, uh, but then when we generate the bit file, it it figures out how to take what's described in the net list and program it into our FPGA, given our specific exact P FPGA. Um, if you want to look at sort of the the spectrum of programmable logic, uh, it sort of follows along this line. Uh, you start with just uh, off-the-shelf gates and you can hook up discrete components. Uh, hardly anybody's going to be doing this anymore. Uh, the next thing that came along is we, we had these small programmable logic devices, uh, programmable array logic, programmable, programmable logic arrays, programmable logic devices. And then the next step was to build these, uh, pack a whole bunch of these into a single chip, and that gave us our complex programmable logic device. The next thing then, uh, we just bunched a whole bunch of these uh, CPLDs kind of in, a, in, a, in one big thing, and that actually turned it into a, uh, a, um, a field programmable gate array, the FPGA. And that's kind of where we are today um, for, as far as just writing a bit file is concerned. Um, these chips have gotten quite large and very, very powerful. If you, if you need, if you're going to mass produce things in very large numbers, and if you want a little more control of, uh, of the timing, then you can go to one of these mass programmable gate arrays, uh, where you basically have a, uh, uh, a large chip that's already mostly fabricated, and you're just doing the last step where you tie all the, all the underlying gates together to make the device you want by, by adding a final uh, metalized mask on top that does all the connections. Or you can just develop an integrated circuit from the from the bottom up. Um, all right. And let's see if I can. Yeah, and that's what the PLA, PAL, PLA, and PLD stand for. All right. Okay. So let's moving on. What you'll notice is. Um, at this point, these off-the-shelf things and these small programmable devices are really not part of the current uh, uh, set of tools that people use. Uh, there still are uh, CPLDs around, um, but most of the time we're going to go with an FPGA or one of these other choices up here. Okay, um, VHDL. So uh, VHDL is a very high-speed integrated circuit hardware description language. It's an acrostic within an acrostic. We studied this briefly in logic design, um, and this one this one pr probably predate, it predates Verilog, uh, but Verilog sort of won the competition for being the most one used. Um, uh, so it it originally was funded and developed by the Department of Defense for their prime contractors, and um, uh, it came out of the ADA, uh, ADA language. Uh, ADA is a, is a computer language that's just very, uh, it's a pretty rigid, very stereotyped language. And it's used, it, was, it certainly was used for a lot of our weapon systems. I don't know, I, I'm not sure if it still is or what, but uh, given how fast the DOD makes changes, it probably still is. Um, and th that's why VHDL looks the way it does, because it, it has its syntactic roots in ADA. Um, the um, original purpose of 
uh, VHDO was to document software programs written in ADA. And then somebody really smart looked at it and said, hey, you know, we can actually, uh, this is good enough that we can actually simulate um, our software using, uh, using VHDL. So then they went from, uh, then they went from just uh, using it to document to actually using it for simulation. And then uh, somebody got really smart and actually wrote up a, um, uh, a synthesizer that could turn it into uh, uh, an, an actual circuit, either using a, an FPGA with a bit file or uh, eventually synthesizers to actually generate all the tools that it would take to, to go to the foundry and make the integrated circuit. So this has been an evolution. It's been an evolution uh, for both VHDL and Verilog. All right. Um, Verilog, on the other hand, uh, was a proprietary set of software made by made by sort of the industry, and um, this was about 2001 2005. It became a IEEE standard. What happened? They sort of saw that it was kind of um, getting displaced by VHDL, and so they took it from a proprietary thing to more of an open standard, and uh, that was about the time that uh, that uh, well, not too long after uh, Cadence acquired it, they started moving that direction, and the standard uh, issued in '95, uh, and then it's been revised a couple of times. Because uh, uh, very log looks a lot like C because it kind of grew out of C. It has its syntactic roots in C, and so that's why a lot of the syntax in very log uh, is. C syntax, but there are differences, and you need to keep that in mind. Um, since then, we've had some additional things. We've had uh, System C has come out. Um, it's a, a design extension of C++, and we've also had System Verilog. Both of these are exciting trends, and it's entirely possible that we're going to see these supplant Verilog in the future. They're still sort of having some growing pains, and they have been, they are being utilized, I'm sure, uh, at some of the bigger companies. Uh, but so far in the department, we really haven't jumped into it yet. So, um, so, ver but, uh, but Verilog is very much related to these things, obviously. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Verilog specifically. Okay. Um, so, Syntax. So reserved words, uh, they can't obviously be used as identifiers because that would screw everything up. So there are some reserved words and you can't use them as identifiers. Words like module, end module, begin, and um, I don't know, parameter. There's a whole bunch of them. So any, any of the reserved words we come across that are used to describe aspects of the very log syntax cannot be used as identifiers. But identifiers can include Letters, numbers, underscore character, and the dollar sign. They can begin with a letter or an underscore character, but they can't begin with a number or a dollar sign. And uh, in, in Verilog, generally everything is case sensitive, just like it is in C. Um, all statements in, Ver in Verilog end with a semicolon, just like they do in C. And uh, our comments are just like C. You can do double slash, and anything for the rest of the line after that is considered a comment. Or you can do a, a slash star comment and star slash end the comment. Um, and that can that syntax can comment a block of code. So um, I prefer uh, far and away the double slash. And many of our integrated development environments will let you highlight a block of code and then uh, click comment it out and you'll and it'll automatically put double slashes in front of it all the way through um, so uh, so for that reason uh, I really prefer it uh, because if you if you use the slash star star slash there are some pitfalls that can be uh, encountered one of them is if you can't you you it is illegal to embed slash star star slash uh, comments within other slash star star slash comments and sometimes if you use a bunch of uh, slash star star slash comments on individual lines 
and then you want to come out the whole block using slash star star slash then you find you you're, you're automatically going to have these embedded slash star star slash things in there and that that can get real messy very quickly so i i don't like that syntax i like the the double slash and just come at out every single line you need and don't do big blocks at a time with the star with the slash star star slash construct but to each his own that's fine um all right so how does very log describe a simple circuit uh, this is a very i think we looked at something very similar to this in logic design for vhdl so we have an AND gate feeding an OR gate uh, with an extra variable going to the OR gate and an output of E. Okay, so, uh, and let's say in this particular case, each gate has a five nanosecond propagation delay. So how would we write this? So let's see, I guess I, I keep, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move this over. Okay, so we can do this. So, uh, here we have the, uh, the what's called the assignment operator, which is the equal sign. Now this is one of the things that's a little different in between Verilog and VHDL. So from this point on, we're not going to really talk about VHDL. We're just going to forget about it, forget we ever saw it. Uh, so you can just learn the Verilog stuff. And then if you want to go back and, and learn the differences in syntax, that you're welcome to do that. But we're not going to we're not going to fixate on that in this course because it is it's kind of a distraction. All right, so although these we have similar functions in VHDL, we're just going to talk Verilog. So in Verilog, the equal sign is called the assignment operator, and oftentimes we'll uh, add the keyword assign to it. Uh, so uh, so what we might the way we might write this then is like this. Uh, so here we have uh, a standard assignment and so uh, let's let's tear this apart a little bit so first we start with this uh assignment keyword assign keyword now one of the things that you'll quickly discover in verilog that is different than vhdl is that the syntax in verilog is a little loosey-goosey so for instance in this case you can put in the assign word or not you can just leave it out it really is, makes no difference um, it kind of helps if you put it in when you first start writing code, but then later on you can get sloppy and start leaving it out. But in any event, it, it will compile and run just fine, uh, or synthesize just fine, whether you put the assigned keyword in or not. This, this pound five, so a couple of things about that. First off, at the beginning of every program, at the beginning of the top module that applies to all the modules in your project, uh, you set up a... a, a, a uh, a comment uh, or a, a directive called uh, tick time and uh, you put a apostrophe and then time the word time uh, all lowercase and then you lay out what your unit of simulation time uh, is and typically we do nanoseconds with uh, with a picosecond uh, uh, resolution so anyway, so when you write pound five, depending on what your what your your tick time directive says, uh, if it says nanoseconds, then that's five nanoseconds. If it says uh, if it says uh, ten, 10 nanoseconds, then that would be fifty nanoseconds. If it says seconds, that's five seconds. So obviously those would be crazy things to put, but uh, normally we normally we write in terms of nanoseconds. So unless Unless you hear differently, you can assume that somewhere at the beginning of these examples, there's always a, uh, a directive that says tick time, uh, uh, nanoseconds slash picoseconds. Um, and what this pound five then means is that's the propagation delay, or, or we typically call this a uh, inertial delay. That's how long it takes the gate to chunk through the change, any change in A and B and come up with a new C result that's now valid. And what this is saying is that before you can comp confidently assume that C has responded to changes on A and B, you have to wait five nanoseconds. And during that five nanoseconds, we really can't guarantee what's happening to C. Now, two things. One, this has nothing to do with the hardware you're making. When you make, a, when you make an AND gate, uh, it depends on the technology of that AND gate. So if, if that AND gate's uh, 
a CMOS gate that's running at five volts, it's gonna it's gonna have one uh, speed at which it's gonna flip. And if it's a if it's running at 0.8 volts, but it's seven nanometer technology, it's gonna flip at a different speed. And uh, everything everything in between. If it's uh, running at 1.8 volts, but it's uh, well, I don't even know if we'd run 1.8 volts on say 150 nanometer technology, but it's gonna it's gonna have a different time constant. When you write these things, you're not telling the synthesizer how to make the gate so it so it has a five nanosecond delay. What you're what you're doing is you're telling the synthesizer that the gate that you understand that your synthesizer is going to make, or the gate it's going to be using on your FPGA that it's going to program the bit file into has a propagation delay of, of about five nanoseconds. And so what this means then is when you simulate your code, you expect to get a result that's relatively faithful to the actual real time involved uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the actual firing of these gates. So, so you, put the, you put the propagation delay in that matches the hardware you're targeting so that your simulation is more accurate. I hope that makes sense. Um, and we also have another type of delay, which we'll cover later on, but where we put the, uh, where we put the delay sign on the other side, and then we're talking about a transport delay. And uh, there's a difference in the way the simulator manages propagation delays and transport delays, and we'll talk about that down the road. But for now, we're just going to primarily run it to propagation delays. The uh, so remember the 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 delay the five nanosecond delay specified here is only for simulation. It, it does not synthesize. The synthesizer doesn't say, "Okay, I'm going to make a gate with a five nanosecond delay." No, it does not do that. Um, what it what it's sort of saying is that you're you're telling the the simulator, not the synthesizer, but the simulator, when we simulate this code. Uh, pretend that the actual hardware we're going to get will have a propagation delay of about five nanoseconds, so that your simulation is relatively accurate. And and one of the upshots of that for propagation delays is, if if A and B change, the five nanosecond clock starts, but C doesn't get uh, doesn't get changed. If within that five nanosecond window, A and B go back to their original values, then C won't be changed at all. It will that that change that small change in A and B will essentially be filtered out as noise because it it doesn't it's shorter than the propagation delay. So any change in signals that revert back to their original value that's shorter than five nanoseconds will have no effect on C in the simulation. Again, this is all in simulation. All all these propagation delays and transport delays only have to do with simulation. When you actually make the gate, the gate works the way it works. It depends on what technology you used. Um, you know, if you used the FPGA, depends on the technology that that FPGA you used. If you build it a, a uh, integrated circuit, depends on what integrated circuit technology you used. And it, it could be, it could be, it could change whether those numbers are really reflect anything close to reality. Uh, one other really important thing here is. What happens when you, it, what is the impact of the order of these statements? And here, here you have this statement first, C equals A, and with B. These are logical ands because there's two ampersands, logical or two vertical lines. And then E is the result of C logically ordered with D. Now we write it the other way. E is uh, equals to C ordered with D, and C equals A and B and added together. So is there any is there any effect of ordering these statements? And the answer is no. There is no effect at all. Those statements can be in any order at all. As long as they are assignment statements, then they can be they can be in whatever order you want. And it does not matter. So so keep that in mind. When we get to always blocks, you will see that in always blocks order may matter or it may not. But in but in but outside of always blocks, the order does not matter. What's also true is whenever whenever these uh, these signals on the right side, in this case A B and C D, whenever they change, 
it will trigger the execution of this statement. So if, for instance, uh, B changes, then that statement, then C will be updated. And then if C is changed, then that will trigger the execution of this statement, and it will update E. And that's, that's true across, if you could have a thousand statements like this with different interactions between them, and, and they would all be responding just like that. If any of the signals on the right side change, you update the left side. And if that changes other right-sided signals for other, other, uh, uh, other assignment statements, they would also update. Now, why do we do it that way? We do it that way because, look at this. We have two gates right here, right? So if A changes, we're clearly going to have a, potentially at least, have a new result for C, and then we'll have to have a new result for E, potentially. Maybe it won't change it, maybe it will. If, on the other hand, we change D, it won't affect this gate, but this, this CD gate uh, will update and generate a new value for E, assuming it changes. Now, if C is 1, D can change all at once. It won't affect D. Um, but if C is 0, then changing D could make a big difference. All right. We call these uh, concurrent statements. And that's just like our concurrent, uh, that's just like our, uh, our uh, combinational design. Um, our, the way these work is there's no, there's no memory. When the when the right side updates, the le when the right side changes, the left side will update. It's, so it's just like a black box with your right side signals going in and your left side signal coming out. Anytime the signals going into this black box change, it'll re it'll update C with a small propagation delay, and C will then be updated. Uh, sometimes in our code, we we don't even bother to put in the propagation delays. Uh, that's kind of lazy man stuff. It's really good to put them in, but there could be occasions where you uh, where you don't bother with them. Uh, but normally, in most projects, the the simulations are very very important, and so you do want to have good simulations. You want to have good uh, estimates of the timing, so you can uh, so you have some sense of where your timing problems are if you begin to have timing problems. Uh, all right. And, um, yeah, so you can put in this optional delay or not. And, again, uh, you can also leave out the assignment statement, word, keyword. All right, so here's an example. Now, this, this uh, confused me. Okay, so, um, so I said this slide was somewhat confusing, and that, and, and that is because... This only applies to the simulation world. So you would only see uh, this, well, uh, the, actual, the actual Verilog statement would be something like this. Assign uh, a delay of 10 nanoseconds, clock equals inverse clock. You would never, ever, ever write that in your, your main module that you were going to turn into hardware. Because if you did this in hardware, it, it doesn't work like this. It doesn't work correctly. Uh, it would be all screwed up. But in our simulator, where everything is perfect, simulation simulation is perfect, uh, and a simulated value is can only be 0 or 1. We don't allow things in between. This, this actually works quite well. Why would we use this in simulation? We do that because in our simulation, and what we call these test benches, we write some code, and then we, we take our our huge module or small module or whatever it is, whatever our project is, and we instantiate that entire project inside our test bench. Uh, and the test bench then drives all the inputs to our module and, and it monitors all the outputs coming from the module. Now, most of the time, almost everything we do uh, in, in our, uh, in our uh, FPGA world will involve a clock. In fact, it turns out uh, if you don't use a clock, you'll, you'll, it, oftentimes it won't work correctly. Uh, so we, often, we almost always use a clock. Well, when you simulate it, remember your test bench is providing all the signals to your module and it's monitoring all the signals coming from your module. And at least one of those signals is usually a clock. 
There might be more than one clock. And so when you, because of that, we, we have to generate the clock in our test bench. And this is a way you generate the clock in the test bench. So again, this is strictly test bench and, and only test bench. And what this, is, what, with, what this will give us in the test bench is a perfect square wave. If you tried to actually build this in your, in your actual hardware that you wanted to synthesize, this would not work correctly. You'd get some skewed thing here. None of it would be crisp and clean like this. It would look like probably a sawtooth or something. And, and, it might, and it might run, you know, who knows how fast it would run. It, it, but, and your signal might never get up to the proper voltage for a one. It might get partway up and then start coming back down because the output's connected to the input and it would start to screw up the input changing. So we would never use this in an actual circuit. Only in the test bench, and only in the test bench, it, it looks like this. Just for simulation, not for real hardware. All right. Okay, so um, what do we do when we have three gates that all have different propagation delays? Well, we can specify a different delay for every gate, and that's quite easy to do. We just do it like this. So uh, when A changes, all of these assignment statements will up, start their update at the same time. But if, if we're, and if we're doing it in hardware, then they update whenever the hardware completes. But if we're simulating our hardware, then E would update in one nanosecond, D would update in two, and F would update in three. And if our change in A only lasted for, say, uh, one and a half nanoseconds, then E would update, but D and F would never update. And then after E went back, after A went back down to whatever it had been, then E would update again. Uh, but D and F would wouldn't show any changes at all if that if that change in A was only a one and a half nanosecond pulse. So that that in, that in, that prop that inertial delay or propagation delay does work as a little bit of a glitch filter to filter out small uh, changes in in in, a, in our variables that don't last long enough to meet the propagation delay requirements. Now that's in simulation. In the real world, what would it do? Uh, there might be some change in E that you would see, but it wouldn't probably get to its regular full, I mean, sorry, E would, but you might not see, you might see a, a start of a change in D, but then it would drop back to its regular value when A went back to its original state. And, and F might not ha show any change at all. And so it's a little unpredictable what's going to happen in the real hardware, but in our simulation, this, this can tell us if we might have a problem. That's the idea. Um, okay, multiple bit signals. So we, we definitely have things we call vectors, and these also can be called one-dimensional arrays. Um, we also can have two-dimensional and three-dimensional arrays in, in Verilog, so, uh, and we'll talk about those down the road, but uh, this is what a one-dimensional array looks like. A couple of things to say. Note how we we're, we do we, we we have this term out here wire. We'll we'll come back to this in a little bit, but we we have basically two kinds of signals that we will use in this course: wires and registers. Registers are not they're, they're, the word the keyword for register is R E G, uh, so it's abbreviated. <coughs> and the difference between a wire and a register is a wire is just that it it is a it literally just connects two things, and the wire itself has no storage capability at all. Uh, it may have a little bit of transport delay associated with it because of its length, uh, but other than that, the wire has no real impact on anything. Uh, it just connects two things. Whereas a register does have the ability to store uh, values, and uh, sometimes we'll, sometimes the registers will also be called latches. Uh, often they, they're just implemented as flip-flops, but sometimes they're more like a, like a degated latch. But in any event, um, and that, that distinction between flip-flop and latch is dependent on whether or not there's an edge-triggered clock involved or not. If there's no edge-triggered clock, then we normally do call it a latch. In any event, um, so here's our one-dimensional array, and uh, B, and notice also we, we label it 3 to 0 instead of you know, just putting the number four there like we would in in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, C. When we declare an array in Verilog, we specify the order of the bits, and we normally 
most of the time when we're declaring it, we want the higher order bit on the left, so we will go from higher order to lower order. And here, this 3 colon 0 means we have bits 3, 2, 1, and 0, and they're in that order left to right. You can also write them the other way, and, and oftentimes in a two-dimensional array, we'll have each word will be ordered with the higher order bit to the left, but we'll order the actual words in the array from zero to whatever word we go to. And we almost always start with zero. Um, it, that's generally what happens. Um, you can also specify part of a vector. We could say two to one, and we'd specify the middle two bits of that vector. And so we have a little more power in our description uh, of uh, one-dimensional arrays, which we call vectors in Verilog, than we do in C. Now, this is not legal in C, but in Verilog, we, 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 are, we allow this. So here's the assignment. Now, this is another uh, bugaboo here. Uh, the assignment operator, you've seen this before, and we're saying B. Notice we don't, we don't have to specify any kind of uh, it, uh, uh, subscript here. So if we just say B, that means we're gonna we're gonna we're writing to the whole four-bit uh, word, and in this case we have a constant. This this is the way our constant notation is, and it's a little tricky, and you just have to sort of uh, work at understanding this. But so this is the way it works. The first digit here, four, is the number of bits, and then we have a, a an apostrophe, and then we have our radix. In this case, our radix is binary or base 2. And then we have the value, the actual constant value. In this case, it's the binary number 1100. And in this case, we have specified all bits. We don't always, and when we don't, then you have to know what rules apply to the non-specified bits. So it's in the early going, it's better to specify all the bits so you know what, you know what you're getting. Uh, later on, when you get a little expertise, you can uh, you can cheat a little bit. There's also some other pieces of this that we're not going to talk about right now because it turns out this notation for the constant values is quite complex. But uh, but as far as this goes, we can also instead of a B, we can have a D for decimal. Uh, can we? Yeah, I guess. But but often we'll use hex. Uh, so we usually we usually do binary or hex, but you can also do decimal. Uh, but decimal gets a little crazy because there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of bits and the decimal digits. Uh, so normally we, we use binary or hex or even octal. That's an O. Uh, so sometimes we'll do that. All right. Um, what this assignment statement does, it takes the four bits of B and it assigns them in order 1100. Zero, zero. So it lays it out down here in our comments. Uh, this last one should be double slashes. I don't know why that got left off. Uh, it's I don't know why they put one one slash. Should be two. All right. So assigns one to be three, one to be two, zero to be one, and zero to be zero. It does it in order from left to right. One one zero zero because we specified it three two one zero in our original uh, description. All right. So there's a lot in this slide that's new to you. Uh, the concept of wire, concept of declaring a vector, normally going from the higher order bit to the lower order bit, and this concept of how we specify constants in Verilog. All right, um, here is an array of AND gates. Um, so we have uh, we have variables A and B and C. A and B and C are all four-bit vectors, and uh, they're all three to zero. And we can write this then. Well, we, well, we can do it a couple different ways. We can write it the hard way, where we just lay everything out. C three equals A three logically ended with B three. C two equals A two logically ended with B two. C1 equals A1 logically ended with B1, and C0 equals A0 logically ended with B0. So that's completely uh, completely legit, but we can also do that um, but in this way. And here you see, notice we use the double ampersand here, which is the logical operator. We could have also used the bitwise here. 
For a single bit, the logical and the bitwise are identical. But down here, we use the bitwise operator. And, and if, you, if you use the logical operator, you definitely change the meaning down here because these are 4-bit vectors. And I'll, 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 I'll explain that. Let me, let's see, let me see if I can do this. Well, yeah, so let me, yeah, let me see if I can do this a little bit. I'll, I'll write a little bit here and see if we can make sense of it. All right. Let me change the cameras here. I'm going to increase this. And I'm going to switch the camera. All right. And we'll hopefully get it focused. Maybe. Close enough. All right. So, so what I wanted... Um, Let's see, I already forgot what I was going to do. Uh, I wanted to explain uh, how these, oh, the difference between the logical, yeah. Okay, so again, so, so our ampersand, so there's the logical and there's the bitwise. Now let's say we have, we'll take the example. Um, well, I don't know, we didn't have a full example. Let's say A is 3 to 0 and it equals uh, uh, 4 tick B uh, one zero zero one, and let's say B is uh, three to zero, and it equals four tick B one 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 zero. Okay. Now, if we if we and if we logically and A logically ended with B, and that equals C. Okay, and we'll do that. We'll say a sign, but we don't have to have that in there, so we'll just write it like this. What would C be equal to? Well, in this case, C would be equal to 0, 0, 0, 1. And that is because a logical result always either turns either returns the value 0 or 1, nothing else. It evaluates A. If A is non-zero, then it's true. It evaluates B. If B is non-zero, then it's true. And it gives and a true with true of true and true is represented by the value 1. If A were 0 or B were 0, regardless of the other one, then we would get false, and that's represented by 0, in which case C would equal 0, 0, 0, 0. Now our bitwise operator, we can write it the same, C equals A, bitwise ended with B, and now what do we get? Well, if we and these, we compare each individual bit, and so we compare the first bit here with that bit, this bit with that bit, this bit with that bit, and this bit with that one. So this comparison results in a 1. 1 ended with 1 is 1. 0 ended with 1 is 0. 0 ended with 1 is 0. And 1 ended with 0 is 0. So, so this gives us a result of uh, 1, 0, 0, 0. So they give totally different results. And it's really important to keep in mind the distinction made between a logical and a uh, bitwise uh, operator. Okay, let's we'll switch the cameras back. All right, and see how we're doing. I think we're. I think I'm just about done. I think we'll quit here in just a minute. Um, so uh, we make just a little, little bit. Um, yeah, so we hopefully answered the question why we must use bitwise operators. Okay, so when you have vectors, you have to think about bitwise operators. Uh, if you want to handle each bit individually, then you have to use bitwise. If you want to treat the whole thing as true or false, then you can use the logical. Okay, arrays are complicated. And uh, I threw this in here. We'll deal with this a little more. But... Uh, here you can see um, so here here's here's an array of X okay and this array is labeled uh, 31 to 0 on the left and on the right 127 to 0 you could label this one 0 to 127 in fact that's normally what we do uh, 
we would normally label it that way. And what that would say is our rows would be numbered starting at row 0 and going to row 127 instead of starting at row 127 and going to 0. But our but each of our words, it's a 32-bit word with the higher order bit being bit 31 and the lower order bit being 0. So this is a 128 element array uh, 32 bits wide. And and like I said, actually, uh, let me, let me, yeah, I'm going to change that. Just, I want you to see this. All right. So this is really how I would normally write this. Now you could write it the other way. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference how they're actually stacked. But normally I think of a ROM, I think, you know, I think it's organized 0 to 127. Whereas whereas in our in my word, I definitely want the higher order bit to be 31 and the lower order bit to be 0. But it's not super critical how you order these uh, typically in a ROM anyway. It doesn't matter. But it sort of makes more logical sense to me to flip them. It also helps me keep straight which one I'm dealing with. Um, so if you want to, yeah. Okay, so anyway, here's another one. This is, uh, this is, um, so we have here, uh, we have an array Y that is, has 16-bit words in it, and there's eight of them. Again, this could easily be 0 to 7. And then we have a comma, and now we have Z, which is just an, an 8-bit, a single 8-bit vector. Here we have uh, uh, 256 entry memory uh, MEMA of 8-bit registers. So you have you have 250, 55, 255 to 0, and you could write that 0 to 255 either way, it doesn't matter. Whereas you and you, but you still want your higher order bit in each word to be bit seven and your lower order bit to be zero. So you have an eight bit, an eight eight bit, eight bits per 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 uh, eight words, and you have a stack of uh, two hundred fifty six of them. Here, um, here this is a little different. So now notice we. We wrote, we had the seven in front of the MEMA there, and then we had this. So now we have both of the indexes after our, our array name, much like we would in C, say, but again, in C, you would just have a single number in here, not, not a range. But what this means is we're implying that the leading index here would just be a zero, just one bit. So this is a two-dimensional array of single bits, whereas this is a one-dimensional array of 8-bit words. All right, so these are some examples. We'll talk about some of these more. But I think I'm going to quit there. We'll pick up on Wednesday. And I will put on the board by Friday uh, the uh, prereq test for you to take to uh, help out our A-bit process.